Take God's word this morning, please, and open to the book of Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 11 down to verse 17 of Colossians chapter 2. Would you stand for the reading of God's word, please? Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are raised with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Thank you so much. You may be seated. This is God's inerrant word, his inspired word. May God help us to understand it today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I'm utterly dependent upon you and your help. As I preach this morning, would you fill me with your spirit? Would you help me to be clear? And would you speak to hearts and do what no man can do? Draw men unto yourself as Christ is exalted. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It was C.S. Lewis who wrote a book that was titled The Shadowlands. And that book was about his marriage and the loss of his wife through cancer. And the reason the book is titled The Shadowlands is because in C.S. Lewis' mind, all of us who live here on the earth were living in the shadows. You see, the heaven is the reality. This is just the shadowland. A shadow is just simply a reflection of something that is real. And heaven is the reality. We are living here in the shadows. Now, he loved that concept because this same concept appears in other books that he wrote. But the basic idea that he was trying to communicate is the shadow prepares us for the substance. And this is a, really Paul's point in Colossians. He's telling the believers there to get out of the shadows and to embrace the reality, embrace the substance. And we see this in the contrast in the verses that we just read in verse 16 and verse 17. Look at them again. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body, or we could say the substance, is of Christ. And the tragedy is there were some believers that were going back into the shadows instead of embracing the reality. Now, remember the problem that Paul was writing about in the book of Colossians. There was a heresy that had sprung up in the church, and the big idea that they were really promoting is that Christ is good, but Christ is not enough. In order for you to find true salvation, in order for you to try find true spiritual maturity and perfection, you need more than just Christ. And Paul writes against this idea. We see it in verse 10, where it says, you're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Paul says, no, you're complete in Christ. But the heresy taught that Christ was not sufficient. And they were trying to teach believers to embrace other things besides Christ. And there was a lot of philosophy, a lot of isms. Uh, Dr. R.G. Lee used to say, isms that ought to be wasms. And in verse 8, he is encouraging them to embrace intellectualism. Look again at verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Uh, some were adding to Christ uh, man-made rituals. And intellectualism is trying to think your way to God. And Paul says, no, all you need is Christ. And now here the problem is, is they're trying to add to Christ ritualism, or we could say legalism. That's why Paul says in verse 16, don't let anyone judge you with respect to performing certain rituals. Rituals would have to do with what you eat or certain uh, feasts and certain holy days. 
Uh, no doubt part of this heresy was a mixture not only of Gnosticism, but of Jewish legalism, and that was kind of all amalgamated together in this heresy. But again, the whole idea is Christ is not enough. You need this ritual along with Christ, you see. And it's this ritual that they said will make you more acceptable to God. And by the way, there are people that still teach that. They might not come right out and say it, that in order to be really more acceptable to God, you have to go through this spiritual ritual. For example, the Hindus, uh, they offer prayer, and then they wash, they have bathings in the holy Ganges River, thinking that by doing that, in some way, it'll make them more acceptable to their gods and goddesses. And so a ritualism is this excessive attention to some form or ceremony as a way to get you to heaven or to make you more spiritual or more acceptable to God. Now, let me just say that ritual in and of itself is not wrong. I mean, we all have rituals, right? I mean, we have the ritual of baptism. Uh, when we have a marriage cer ceremony, there are certain rituals that come with that ceremony when the preacher pronounces them, husband and wife, and so on. So rituals in and of themselves are not wrong, but the problem comes when people think that by obeying this ritual, it will get them to heaven, or it can add anything to what they have already in Christ. And so this was the problem. And by the way, that's why churches all over America are filled with lost people, because they have this idea that they've done some religious ritual that made them acceptable to God. And they're depending more on uh, religion and rituals than they are Christ. And we should be depending upon the finished work of Christ alone. But many people put their faith in rituals. And so Paul is dealing with this right here. And uh, they're Colossian Christians who are being judged by these Gnostic heretics who called themselves Christians, and they were saying that you're not truly a believer because you're not going through these religious rituals, and they're being judged. And Paul says, don't let anyone judge you in that way. Don't let anyone cause you to go back into the shadows. All of those Jewish rituals of the past, all of those things were really just a way to point to the reality. It was to point to Christ. So don't trade the substance for the shadow. Don't go living back in the shadow lands. Come out of the shadow lands and embrace the reality. And so what we see here in this are five reasons why you don't need these things, why you need just Christ and Christ alone, and he is sufficient, and you need to get out of the shadows. Here's the first reason, number one, Paul gives, and that is you've already had a spiritual operation. Look at verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands and the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, there were some that were saying that you needed to add this ritual of circumcision to Christ because there were many Jews that believed that this was a way of salvation. They had taken something that God instituted in the Old Testament as a sign of people's commitment to God, and they made it a way of salvation. And in fact, did you know that there were some rabbis that taught that if a, if a Jew was circumcised, he would never go to hell. Let me quote to you what the Midrash says. It says, God swore to Abraham that no one who was circumcised would be sent to hell. Abraham sits before the gate of hell and never allows any circumcised Israelite to enter. That was a typical view back in Jesus' day. And of course, that was wrong. But here they were saying, you need to add this. And Paul's saying, no, you don't need to add circumcision to Christ because you were already circumcised. Look at verse 11 again, in whom you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Paul said, look, the moment you were saved, you were circumcised spiritually. That's the idea here. Notice where it says in the operation or made without hands, and the circumcision made without hands, when you see that expression made without hands, that's talking about a work of God. This is something that man doesn't do. This is something that God does. Write down Romans 2.29. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. He goes on to say, which praise is not of men, but of God. This was something that God did to you at salvation. In fact, the whole ritual of circumcision in the Old Testament pointed to true salvation. You see, it pointed to the cleansing that was necessary 
for salvation. The, this surgery was a sign of the sinfulness of men that was passed from generation to generation. It spoke of the need for cleansing. It was symbolic of man, his sinfulness, who was sinful at the very center of his being and his heart needed to be cleansed. And so Paul says, listen, when you got saved, you received a spiritual circumcision made without hands. Again, speaking of divine work. Remember, we see this phrase in 2 Corinthians 5.1, when, when this tabernacle, this body here, is no longer any good, when I move out of this tabernacle, I'm going to move into a house not made with hands. That's my spiritual home there in heaven. And so Paul is talking about a spiritual operation that you've already had the moment that you trusted Jesus as your Savior. This is the circumcision of the heart. And look again at verse 11 where it says, in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Who performs this spiritual operation? Christ does. And what does he do? The word putting off here is a total breaking away. It means the breaking away of the power that was previously over you. And what was that power? The body of the sins of the flesh. That's referring to the sin nature. You know what happened the moment you got saved? Jesus did a spiritual operation and he cut away that former power that was over you, the sin nature. Now you don't have to listen to that sin nature anymore. You know why? It's been cut away from you. It's been divorced from who you are. It was done by the, not by the hands of men, but with Christ who did that. Your old nature was cut away. You became a new creature. You received a new nature. And the sin nature no longer has any authority over you. Do you realize the only authority sin has over you is what you give it? If you obey the sin nature, you're giving that, that sin nature authority over you. But once that relationship has been severed, once it's no longer uh, uh, real in the sense that it has no more authority over you, you don't have to listen. You know what the problem is? We're still conditioned to listen to the sin nature inside of us. But you know what? You don't have to. That's why when people say, well, I had no choice. I mean, the desire in me was so strong. No, that's the sin nature. You don't have to listen. That, was, that sin nature was given no more authority. It was cut away from you. You got a divorce from the sin nature. You see, what woman who was divorced from an abusive husband continues to listen to him after the divorce? You don't need to listen to that tyrant anymore. You don't need to listen to that abusive person anymore. They're no longer in your life. They no longer have authority over you. And if you choose to submit yourself to that, that's your choice. But know this, that you've been given victory over that. And so that's what he's talking about here. You've already had a spiritual operation, no ritual can do that for you. But here's the second thing. You've been baptized into Christ. Look at verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are raised with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. Now, here Paul says you've been baptized with Christ, buried with him in baptism. Now, every time we see the word baptism, people want to automatically in their mind think about water baptism. But I've told you this before. When you see the word baptism in the Bible, it's not always referring to water. Um, you have to look at the context to see what it's talking about. And there are some people that use verse 12 to teach baptismal regeneration. This is the very thing that Paul's against, taking some ritual and saying, this ritual will get you saved. Why would Paul uh, uh, debunk one ritual, circumcision, and then uh, talk about another ritual for salvation, baptism? That's not what he's doing here. What he's basically saying is this. The word baptism means to be placed into or immersed, baptizo. Uh, that word was used consistently in Greek to talk about complete, full immersion. When a ship sunk to the bottom of the sea, a Greek person would say baptizo. When a woman took clothing and she was dying it and she put it all underneath the dye completely, the word baptizo was used. And so when you see the word, it means to be fully immersed in something. And what Paul's talking about here is that the moment you got saved, you were fully immersed into Christ. That's the point. Did you know in Romans 5, the Bible teaches that when God looks down from heaven, he only sees really two men. He sees Adam and he sees Christ. And all of humanity is either in Adam or they're in Christ. And friend, this morning, if you're in Adam, that's a bad thing because in Adam, the Bible says all die. In Adam, all will be punished because of sin. 
But if you're in Christ, friend, that's salvation. And you know what happens at salvation? God takes you out of Adam, and he plunges you, he baptizes you into Christ. You are fully immersed in Christ the moment that you are saved so that you become one with Christ. And that's, what, that's a spiritual reality. And by the way, any time a person is baptized, what they're doing is they're showing through that water baptism a symbol of a spiritual reality that took place when you got saved. You were placed in Christ. You were baptized into Christ. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Now you are one with him. And in the mind of God, you are one with him. So much so that when Christ died, you died. When Christ was buried, you were buried with him. When Christ rose, you rose. And there's a sense in which you're still one with Christ. Christ is in heaven, and that's where you are in the mind of God. You're so much one with Christ that you're already there. You're seated with him in heavenly places. Now, this is a divine mystery, and the reality of it really just blows our mind. That's why this is called the mystical union of the believer. It's mystical in the sense that it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this truth, but it's real. It's real. You are one with the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, how is this done? It's done through the operation of God. Look again at verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, when you are raised with him through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. You know how I accept this? I accept this by faith in the work of God. I accept it by faith that this is what God has done in my life. It is through his power. It is through his operation that when I got saved, I became one with Christ. And that's why I'm saved. And that's why I know I'm going to heaven because I'm one with him. Nothing can ever take me out of Christ. That's why I don't understand how people can believe you can lose your salvation. Friend, you've been placed in Christ and nothing can take you out of Christ. The moment you're saved, nothing. No ritual can do this for you. No outward symbol or ritual uh, what you eat or observing a holy day or some religious thing. None of that can do this for you. You've been, already been baptized into Christ. But here's the third thing. Here's another reason you need to step out of the shadows, embrace the substance. Number three, you've been completely forgiven. Look at verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. You know, when you were made one with Christ, not only did you die with him and bury with him, but you were made alive and you were resurrected with him, and you have been forgiven of how many transgressions? All trespasses. All. Sometimes people ask me, how many of my sins were forgiven? All of them, friend. And they'll say, well, what about my future sins? Friend, they were all future when Jesus died. You weren't even born yet. All your sins have been forgiven, all of them. And there's a beautiful picture that Paul uses to help us understand this total forgiveness. Look at verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The word for handwriting here literally means autograph, your actual writing. It's a technical word. It's very interesting. It's used to talk about writing out an IOU. It was a handwritten note to a debtor acknowledging your indebtedness. It would be like me writing, I, Jerry Harmon, owe Aaron Finley $1,000, and then writing it out. By the way, I don't know you anything, Aaron, so don't come down and try to claim it. But I'd say I owe him, I'd write it out, and I would have that, put it down there, and I would have to acknowledge, yes, that's right, that's my handwriting. I owe him this. Did you know that you have an IOU against God? And it's all of the sins that you have committed against him. It was all written down, and it's all right there. It's a debt, a handwriting of ordinances. And what does Christ do for us when that happens? This, this receipt, this, this debt, you know, it's right there. What does he do to it? You know, you ever, you ever go out to eat with someone, maybe a group, and then the check comes and is put down on the table? And everyone's looking at each other. It's that awkward moment. Like, who's going to pick up this check? Who's going to do it? So I love that that commercial. I feel it's a Geico commercial where there's the alligator sitting at the table, and he's got short arms, and he's trying to reach it. Oh, I 
I can't reach that debt there, you know. Some people have short arms when you go out to eat with them. But the debt for our sin was right there. It was laid down, all of my sins. And you know what Jesus does? He reaches out and he says, I'll take care of that. Look at verse 14. Took it out of the way, in verse 14, and took it out of the way. That is, he, he took it out of our hands. He took it, and what did he do? He nailed it to the cross. Jesus said, I'll pay this receipt. I'll pay this debt. Did you know that Romans, when they would crucify criminals, they would sometimes nail the list of crimes that that person committed on the cross? And people, when they walked by, they would see those crimes and knew that the person was being crucified for those things. But when Jesus died on the cross, he was sinless. He was guiltless. He was innocent. Whose crimes were there? They were my crimes. They were my sins. They were your sins. All those were nailed to the cross. And Jesus died in my place. The wrath of God that should have fallen upon me fell on Christ. He paid that sin debt. And then you know what happens now? Look again at verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. You know what happens? It literally means to erase, to wipe it away. You know, in the ancient world, they didn't have paper the way we have it. They would take a, a, the reed plant along the Nile River, and they would kind of make it a papyrus paper. They would take strips of it and lay it next to each other, you know, and they would come up with this ancient paper. And that's what they would write on, and it was kind of hard to get your hands on a lot of that kind of paper. They would also use animal skin. They called it vellum. And both were fairly expensive, and you wouldn't want to waste either. And the ancient ink that they had back then really didn't have acid in it, so it never really bit into the paper or bit into the animal skin. It just simply laid on the surface. The ink did. Now, if anybody messed with it, the ink would remain. But sometimes a scribe wanted to reuse the paper or he wanted to use the animal skin. And he didn't have much money, and so he would just simply take a sponge and he would wet it and he would wipe it off clean and it would be fresh, it would be completely gone. And this is the word here for blotting out. You know what happened when Jesus died on the cross for your sins? They were completely erased. They were blotted out, they're gone. They weren't, you know, like computers today, when you delete a file, it's not really deleted, it's probably put in a trash bin somewhere, you know. The only things that are really deleted are the things that you want to keep. You ever see how that works? A research paper that I lost... Everything else I delete, somehow it finds its way into some other place. Something I really want to keep, the computer gets rid of it. I think these computers have a mind of their own. But, you know, you take something, you delete it on the computer, it really goes into a bin. It's not really deleted. Not so with your sins. On the cross, they were blotted out. They're deleted. They're not in some deletion bin in heaven. They're gone. They're absolutely gone. They're blotted out. That's why the psalmist said, Happy is the man whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. How much forgiveness is there when you're saved? It's total forgiveness. They're blotted out. They're gone. That's why you don't need any ritual. Nothing can add to that. No religious Ritual or shadow can add to that. You've been already had a spiritual operation. You've been baptized into Christ. You've been completely forgiven when you get saved of all of your sins. And then here's the next thing. You have been given total victory. Look at verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. This is total victory. Now, remember, I told you that Gnostics believe that the highest God is not the God of creation. They believe that out of, from the highest God, there emanated lesser gods, uh, demiurge or uh, emanations, as some would call it. And somewhere down the chain was this lesser God. And this lesser God, he was the one who created the, the creation that we know of today. And it was a botched job of creation, they say, uh, because he really mixed together the physical world with the spiritual, and according to the Gnostic mindset, all physical was evil, all spiritual was good. 
And so when he combined it together, he it was kind of like a jeweler mixing together junk metal with gold. He, he botched to that creation. And this creator is not really good. And in the Gnostic mind, you had to get back to spiritual perfection. And you did it by ascending up this ladder of emanations. And in order to do that, you had to have special knowledge, hence the word gnosis, the Greek word for knowledge, secret words that would pass you up the chain. But there was this one God blocking, and it was your job to disobey him. That was Gnostic philosophy. And they were saying Jesus was simply one of these emanations. He's good. That's why it's good to know Jesus, but you need more than that to ascend the ladder, to go all the way back to spiritual perfection. And you know what Paul is saying about all this? It's all junk. Jesus is not one of those spiritual emanations. He's the head of all principalities and powers. In fact, all those semi-gods, they're nothing but the demonic spirit world deceiving you. It's all demonic. There are principalities, there are powers. And by the way, on the cross, Jesus gave you victory over all that stuff. He gave you victory over Satan, the kingdom of darkness, over all these demons. That's what he means in verse, uh, verse 15. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. The word for spoiled here means to strip off the clothing or to disrobe or to shame a person. Make a show of has the idea of publicly shaming. You know what Jesus did to Satan on the cross? He stripped him and he exposed him and he shamed him. Satan and his demons and the whole kingdom of darkness. He did all of that. Openly triumphing. Look at the word triumphing. That is a, ref- a word that refers to the ancient Roman triumph. Did you know that in the Romans, when they had a victory, when a general went on foreign soil, he had a major victory, he would send back word to the city of Rome, and a herald would his dispatch, and he would run back to the city, and he would proclaim throughout the city victory, and the whole city would get ready for what they called a triumph. They would, uh, there was a certain uh, road called the Via Triumphant that went through an archway. People would be burning incense along the side of the, of that a triumphant way. That's where you get this, the expression, the sweet smell of victory. Incense all throughout the city was being burned. People would be throwing rose petals. As the army marched in through the archway, there would be the victorious army, and they would be holding up the spoils of war. And then behind the victorious army would be the victorious general, or actually some of the defeated army would be there in chains. And behind them would be the victorious general riding in a golden chariot. And chained to the chariot would be the defeated general. And normally he would be stripped naked. And he was subdued. He was shamed publicly. Here's this army chained, and the general is shamed. He's stripped naked. He's made a show of openly. That's the whole picture that Paul's giving here. Now, you know what? At the cross, Jesus defeated Satan, and Satan was like that defeated general. He was stripped naked, totally, completely defeated all the principalities and powers. This was a complete and total victory. And by the way, you know who else was there in that parade? It was the family members of all the victorious general, and they would be walking behind the chariot. Why? Because they were sharing in the victory of that general. And by the way, that represents you and me. You know why? Because we share in the victory of Christ. You are victorious because Christ is victorious. That's why you don't have to be afraid of the kingdom of darkness. You don't have to be afraid of Satan and his demons. That's why when I was out there to Scotland and the taxi driver, I was staying in a castle, he said, you better be careful, the place is haunted. There are ghosts in there. And then someone later asked me, how would you sleep? I slept like a baby. I wasn't afraid of anything like that. If you have Christ in you, they should be afraid of you because you are victorious. You share in the victory of Christ. We don't need to be afraid of the kingdom of darkness And this is another reason why we don't need to enter back into the shadows. You have been given total victory in Christ. Let me give you the last thing. You've already had a spiritual operation. You've been baptized. You've been placed in the Christ. You've been completely forgiven. You have been been given total victory over the kingdom of darkness, all principalities and powers. But here's number five. You have been given the substance, not the shadow. 
Look at verse 16 again. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect to a holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things. And Paul's referring here to the Old Testament dietary laws. There were strict laws in the Old Testament with, with, with regard to food and drink and all of that. And also there were feast days in the Old Testament. There were Sabbath days in the Old Testament. And because some of the believers in Colossae were not observing these things, this, these Gnostic heretics that had mixed in some of this Jewish legalism, they were judging these believers and saying, you can't really have true salvation because you're not abiding by these laws. And they were being judged based on what they were eating and the days that they refused to observe and the days that they did observe. And Paul says, don't let any of them judge you on that. You know why? Because all of those things, they were a shadow that pointed to Christ. The feast days, in some way or another, if you go to Leviticus, and we don't have time to do it, but you look at those feast days, each one of them pointed in a way to Jesus Christ. And the Sabbath days, all the Sabbath pointed to Christ, who was given a Sabbath is supposed to be rest. And by the way, Sunday is not the Sabbath, as some people think. Sunday is the Lord's day. It's a special day, and then it's the Lord's day. It was a day the Lord came out of the grave. That's why we set it aside. We sanctify it. But technically, Saturday is the Sabbath, but it means a day of rest. But here's the deal. That stood for the, the rest that you get in salvation. Once you come to Christ, every day is a Sabbath for us. You know why? Because we're resting in Christ who paid our sin debt. All those things were fulfilled in Christ. They're just shadows that point to the reality. And that's what Paul means in verse 17 when he says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body, or we could say the substance, the reality is of Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of all of that. Christ is the reality. Here's a man that comes back from the military in the war. Perhaps he's over on across the ocean fighting, and he comes back. Maybe he's a Navy man, and his wife is there to meet him at the dock, and he gets off the ship, and he starts walking towards his wife, and she sees him coming, and as he's walking, there's a shadow on the ground. How many women are going to go up and look at that shadow and try to hug the shadow? That would be ridiculous. You forget about the shadow when the reality is right there. She doesn't hug the shadow. She hugs Christ, uh, the, the person. And what we're saying here is that in these rituals, they're all shadows. We don't hug the shadows. We hug Christ. We embrace Christ because we are complete in him. And so the question is, have you gone beyond the shadows of religion? Have you embraced the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you come to know Christ? Because if you haven't, I would invite you to do the most important thing that you've ever done in your life, and that is come to him and embrace him. On the cross, he paid your sin debt. And you need only to embrace him to put your faith in his finished work. And if you're a Christian, don't let anyone try to drag you back into those old rituals, to drag you back into the shadowlands by saying that Christ somehow is not enough, that you're not complete in him, that you need other religious rituals that will somehow make you more acceptable to God. Listen, beloved, God will not love you more. He cannot love you less. He loves you perfectly. And when you come to Christ, you are completely accepted in the beloved. And there is no ritual that can make you any more loved, any more accepted. There's nothing that can add to what Christ has done for you. So my, friend, my, my advice to you would be embrace Christ. Learn more of Christ Find all of your fullness in Christ. Know that Christ is sufficient and run to him and him alone. Let's bow for prayer together. And so, Father, I pray that you will take the truth of this passage. And, Lord, would you just please just enlighten our minds with regard to this and place it deeply in our hearts. Because all around us, there are voices that are telling us that Christ isn't enough. There's something else we have to turn to. 
for our spiritual needs, for the needs of our soul, our spirit, our heart, our mind, our emotions, that there's something else that we're missing. Help us to see these voices as lying voices. Help us to realize the truth of what Paul wrote, that ye are complete in him. Who is the head of all principalities and powers. We're totally forgiven. We have had that spiritual operation where the sin nature has been cut away. We have been immersed in Christ. We have been given total victory, complete forgiveness. May we embrace with all of our heart the reality of Christ. Come to him and bow before him and call him Savior and Lord. And friend, if you're here today and you've never done that, I invite you right where you are. You don't have to, you know, we have altar calls. We, we do that from time to time. We haven't been able to do it because of this COVID, but we want to start doing that again here. But the honest truth is you're not saved by coming down an altar. You can show people that you're putting your faith in Christ. You can confess them before man, but you're saved by embracing Jesus Christ alone, by putting your faith in him. And you can do that right where you're seated. You can do it right where you are right now. You can do it by reaching out in prayer. If you're listening to me live stream in your home and sitting on a couch, you can do it right where you are. You can reach out in prayer and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. You paid my sin debt. You blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against me. It was nailed to the cross. And now I'm forgiven if I put my faith in you. Would you do that right now? Lord Jesus, save me. Make me your child. Come into my heart. Save me, Lord Jesus. Father, bless these words to hearing hearts. We pray in Jesus' name.